Amen. Do I have a table? <laughs> okay, thanks. I have to have my table. I'm like Linus without my blanket because I have to lay all this stuff out. If I didn't have to have all this stuff, then I wouldn't have to worry about it, but I got to have it all. While they're looking, oh, there it comes. Oh, Tom, look at that. Woo! Give him a hand. I mean, come on. That's... Man, if I walked up in... Table? <laughs> table for one? If I walked up them steps carrying that table, I'd be in the hospital for a month. Thank you. Yes, sir. Philippians chapter 3 is where we're going to be today. We're going to wrap up. This is actually the last passage out of the book of Philippians. It's the one place that I haven't preached since we started, so the timing ended up pretty well. Um, I sent a letter to the church this week, said a lot of things in the letter. If you didn't get to see it, um, please take a look at it. Just, it's been a great pleasure to be here with you, uh, to be part of this church. I was so excited when <laughs> I got, I'm kind of on a text chain with uh, church staff. When I heard about the attendance numbers from last Sunday and the spirit of the Lord that was in this place, I couldn't have been more excited for this church for its future and how God is going to use you. I mean, I just I, I see great and wonderful things that the Lord is going to flow in and through this church and for, for all of you in the coming days and years. And I, I'll be the biggest cheerleader and fan for all of that because I'm, I'm very excited about it. All right, Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 15. If you'd stand with me, we just have a few verses this morning. Verse 15 through the end of the chapter. Let us, brethren, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I've often told you and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he is even to subject all things to himself. Thank you. You can be seated. You know, America is still, if you were to do a poll today, conduct a poll, pick up the phone, call, oh, they usually poll a thousand people. If you polled a thousand people by confession, by self-confession and vote, America is still a majority Christian nation. Now, but according to the Pew Research Center, that's changing pretty rapidly. Back as recently as 2009, 71% of Americans would identify as Christian. That number's down to somewhere between 60 and 70%, around 65%. And the predictions are that if the trend that we're currently in continues, then what we're going to end up with is a minority Christian nation by 2035. Those are the predictions. Now, some people say that all this is is a revealing of the truth. In other, words, in other words, we never have really been a Christian nation in the way that we've behaved or lived, even as a majority. Some others say, so, so they say this is actually a good thing, that we're getting down to what the truth is. But there are others who say that losing our status as majority Christian is a serious thing because of what's happening to those people, because they're becoming... N-O-N-E-S. They're not converting to, to Catholicism and becoming N-U-N-S, nuns, but they're becoming N-O-N-E-S nuns. That is, people who don't have any affiliation or any concern or thought about the things of God. And so as a church, as the body of Christ, this is something that we must be concerned about. It's something that should cause us to want to live our lives in such a way that we become witnesses that not only 
in the way we live, but intentionally we open our mouths and with boldness and with confidence and with joy, as Philippians constantly says, that we proclaim that Christ is Lord and that because He's Lord, He's made a difference in our lives. And as we look at this today, we find out that a lot of that rests on attitude. It rests on the way we look at life. It rests on whether or not our thoughts undergird and become the foundation for the way we live, for our actions that are lived out. If you look back in verse 15, notice Paul begins by saying, after, and, and by the way, this is kind of a wrap-up of everything he said in chapter 3, this part of the letter. You know, let us therefore, therefore, could, you could back all the way back up to verse 12, not that I've already obtained or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I also laid hold of by Christ Jesus. So Paul is now saying, because everything that I've laid out before now is true, then let us therefore, or let us, let, let us as many as are perfect, that is, have become complete, have this attitude. So I want us to see first that our attitude controls, or, or, or that the idea of being complete controls our attitude. That phrase, have this attitude that we see in verse 15, refers to both our thoughts and our values. Now, Paul is, a, is addressing a group of people in Philippi. He has been very generous with them, and now he's going to challenge them a little bit because when he talks about them being complete, he's kind of addressing an attitude that would have been in the rich young ruler. You know, when the rich young ruler came to Christ and, and, and he wanted to know, what, what must I do? Look at all these things that I've done. He brings his resume. So one thing we probably don't need to do is we bring our resume to Jesus when we're talking about following him. Talk about what we have done. We need to be more concerned or thoughtful about what he would have us to do. So being complete should not be in our estimation. We don't, we don't evaluate ourselves and come up saying we are complete, but to be complete means that we have gone to the Lord, which we're going to get to in just a minute, who knows our heart, and he leads us and shows us what it, need, what, it, what it means to be spiritually mature. What is it that we're missing? Paul's addressing people who believe that they are complete. And if we ever get to the point where we believe that we've arrived on this side of eternity, our growth will be stunted. We should always be in a sense of sanctification. Remember, justification is something that happens immediately when you come to Christ. Sanctification is a lifelong process. We grow in our relationship with Jesus all the time until we get to that point where we see him face to face and we experience glorification. The change of everything, not only our heart and our mind, but our physical bodies are changed and made fit for heaven. So, you, it's possible to have an attitude that says, well, I've arrived, I don't need anything else. And it's possible to have an attitude that says, well, you know, I don't really want anything else. And both of those are detrimental to the mature Christian life. We should always want more, and we should always understand that we have the need for more as long as we're living and breathing and living in this world. There's always room to grow. There's always more that we can know about Jesus. Balance comes you know, my favorite, my favorite movie that talks about balance is The Karate Kid, right? I mean, you've got Mr. Miyagi. Walk it down the right side, safe. Walk it down the left side, safe. I walk a lot down the middle, sooner or later, squish, just like a grape. So what, what is he saying? He's saying, look, balance means that we don't choose, we don't walk down one side or the other, or we, or we walk down, rather we make the decision to walk down one side or the other, we find in our heart the true direction of our life, and then we hold to it. And Paul's going to talk about that and again in, in just a minute. But how do we find out about our attitude? Who reveals our state of completeness and the state of our attitude? It comes from God. God reveals the truth about it. If we pray and seek the Lord, He will reveal the truth about our attitude. Paul believed that the Philippians would listen to God and that they would follow the path he lays out for them as long as they remain humble and that they called on the Lord and brought their 
situation to him and were honest with him about where they were in their relationship. God is the one who reveals. We don't, we don't know. I mean, I, I kind of, sometimes I think I'm doing pretty good, you know. And I go to the Lord, and the Lord reveals to me that, yes, there are things that I'm doing that are pleasing and honorable in his sight, but there are things that I need to work on. It's kind of like we were at a marriage conference, Denise and I. We hadn't been married very long, and we, we went to one of the marriage conferences because they were kind of pushing them back then. And, you know, one of the things the speaker said was, if you think, he was talking to the men, because he said, man, if you think your marriage is a 10, go to your wife and ask her what it is. And whatever she says, that's what it is. And so, you know, uh, he said, because if, if you say it's a 10 and your wife says it's a 6, then you need to figure out how to get from 6 to 10 because it's a 6. And you know, I found that to be true. Women just have, they have a natural sense of how good the relationship is. Most of the time, men, we do, we're just happy, you know. We're just, yep, everything's great. How's your marriage? Oh, man, she loves me. And I love her. And all's good in the world. And then, you know, all of a sudden you sit down and talk to her. Well, here's a, there's a couple of things now that you mentioned. And those are the things that we need to listen to. We need to do the same thing. God is the one. He is the one who knows our heart, our mind better, obviously, than we know ourselves. And we need to listen to him about our attitude. Third thing, once we embrace the right standards, after we get, after we reach maturity or our goal becomes maturity and our attitude is to move toward that goal there are certain standards that we're going to understand and we're going to apply and we're going to grab them and hold on to them and Paul reminds them hold to those standards look at verse 16 it says however let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained the ultimate example for us is to hold on to those standards embrace the standards and there are two things that reflect that are reflected here first we remain true to holding to the right standards and second we submit to the authority of the church concerning those standards now let let me explain what that means a lot of people think fellowship in the church is just what we do in the fellowship hall and 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 it's good that we have it we call it that because we do we get together for meals Um, and we enjoy each other's company, and that's important. But here's the other part of fellowship. Fellowship is also not just encouragement, but it's also accountability. Because the standards that we hold to, I need somebody to remind me sometimes what those standards are. And that's what we should gain from each other, not just going to the lake together, not just having a meal together, not just going out on trips together, not just enjoying the sweetness of relationship, but also being able to pour into each other as the body of Christ, reminding each other of the standards, holding each other accountable. That's an important part of being part of the body of Christ. We don't ever want to be isolated. We don't ever want to be set apart, not only because of the loneliness and the despair that we can enter into without sweet fellowship, but also because we need each other. I need my brothers and sisters in Christ to come along. And and I remember a line from Law and Order when the district attorney said, I need somebody to tell me when my britches are unbuttoned kind of an old southern way of putting it I guess I need somebody to tell me when my shirt tails hanging out I need somebody to tell me when my life is not exhibiting that you know maybe my anger or maybe my frustration or or maybe my attitude needs adjusting who's going to tell me that God is the one who can speak through the fellowship of the body speaking through other brothers and sisters and reminding us how we should live within the community and the fellowship of the church. And that's an important function of the church. Edward Everett Hale wrote a short story entitled A Man Without a Country. Some of you may remember that. It was about Lieutenant Philip Nolan. Now, he, he's a fictional character. Unfortunately, there's a Philip Nolan who was a lieutenant that's a real character that was kind of a hero in the military. And unfortunately, he's been tagged at times with this story because it's the same name but Philip Nolan in 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 this story in a short story he's fictional character but he 
but he commits treason against the United States. And at his trial, he denounces the United States as his country. And the sentence is for him to spend the rest of his life on ships. He's never to set foot on any port. He's never to see a newspaper or hear a word spoken about the United States. And so he lived out the rest of his life going from one ship to another, never getting near the United States. And when he died, he was buried at sea. And so the influence, the mindfulness of his home country was completely erased. And that can happen to us as believers if our sweet fellowship doesn't also include the call in community to live by the standards that God has set. And we should accept that from one another. We should see it not as a correction that is something that we should be mad about, but it's when, when a brother or sister out of love says to us, here's, here's somewhere where I can see in your life that there needs to be a change, we need to accept that and know that if we can trust them, that it's coming from the Lord. Second thing we see here is that Paul sets the example for our attitude. Verses 17 through 19. Look at verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern that you have in us. So it's very important that we we understand that there are earthly examples that we can follow if those people are following God. That's why Paul says, Paul says, it's okay to follow me because I'm following Jesus. Anybody remember the apprentice program? We don't really do that much anymore. Every now and then I'll hear of somebody serving as an apprentice. But back in the colonial days and even after, the way that you got a job, a good job, is you attached yourself to a master builder or you attached yourself to um, a master mechanic or someone who was who knew all about the field that you wanted to get into. I, I can give you a good personal example. We have a good friend named Rita who never really went to school for dentistry or dental hygiene. I mean, in fact, I, I asked her about that one time because she's been working in this dentist office forever, and she's one of the best ones. She's so good at what she does. And she learned every bit of what she knows about dentistry standing at her father's elbow from the time that she was a little girl all the way up until the time that she began to work into the office and do the work. So that would be considered an apprenticeship. But here's the thing. We learn by doing. In other words, you don't learn in an apprenticeship. You learn by getting your hands on the engine. You learn by getting your hands dirty, and you you got to hit your thumb a couple of times with the hammer while you're learning how to build a house or to raise a structure. And you're learning from somebody who's been there and done that. We all have people in our life that we look at, and we know that they're walking with the Lord. It's good to have them as a mentor. It's good to listen to their counsel. But always remember this. Never look directly at them alone. Look beyond them to the Lord. And make sure that the walk that they have is staying in line with the Lord because all of us can stray. And sometimes, even if we have a mentor and we see that they're beginning to, just just like we were talking about the fellowship of the church and the community of the church, fulfilling this function. If we see them start to walk off the path, we need to be the ones to point to Jesus because Jesus is the ultimate example. It's good to have earthly examples, but we keep looking beyond those examples to make sure that Christ and the Word of God is what we're holding firm to. So we walk according to the pattern that's been set for us. Second thing under this, our walk reveals who is the Lord of our life. Look at verse 18. For many walk, of whom I often told you and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, you know this is the only place, the only example we have in the Scripture where we know that Paul actually cried. And look at what he's weeping over. Is he weeping because he's being held in a Roman prison? Is he weeping because it's likely that he's going to be executed? He's not weeping about anything that has anything to do with him. He's weeping over the souls of those he knows have become enemies of the cross. Those who have turned against him, those false teachers, he's still kind of talking about the false teachers here, how they're doing things that are making it difficult for others to follow Jesus. And I I know you can agree with this. You know, 
one of the most difficult and emotionally draining things we face is when we know the truth and we have people that we care about and yet those people insist on holding to a lie and we share the truth and we live out an example and we continue to love them but we become emotionally frustrated and broken as we give them examples of what it looks like when you don't follow Christ and yet they refuse to follow the truth that could be draining but Paul calls us to do it and he says this is the concern that we have now there are people who go beyond just rejecting Christ and they become actual enemies of Christ and Paul talks about them here He's talking about people, not just a failure to accept the full meaning, but to actually go after those people who are trying to live for Christ. And we see that in our world today, don't we? We see Christianity in the crosshairs. And the reason is because there is a mindset and a cultural worldview that's trying to prevail, and it can't prevail as long as the church and scriptural ideas hold sway. And so people have stopped just saying, well, I'm not going to be a believer, but I don't care who is a believer. There are a lot of people now who say, well, I'm not going to be a believer, and if you're a believer, I'm going to come after you. I want to undermine you. I want to stop you from being able to practice your faith because I've got to erase your worldview if my worldview is going to be prevalent. And we see that happening, and Paul goes on to talk about that because our walk reveals our ultimate destination. Look at the next verse. It says, whose end is destruction. He's talking about these people who become the enemies of the cross, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is their shame, and who set their minds on earthly things. Now, this is at the, the immediate context of what Paul is addressing is the Judaizers. And the way we know that is because when he talks about their appetite, he's talking about t- the Judaizers were telling these people to go back to the dietary laws. He was telling them to go back to, you know, be careful about what you eat. It was cultural. Not, he, he was saying, this, this, you've got to maintain Jewish culture and Jewish laws even if you talk about Jesus. You have to do these things. This is Jesus plus. I think I mentioned to you one time before, the Jesus plus crowd. And so he's talking about the Judaizers, but he's also talking about circumcision when he says this, their shame Their their glory is actually their shame. He's talking about, they talk about circumcision, and it's it's a private thing that they speak of publicly, and it becomes a shameful thing because they're telling people that they have to follow the Jewish law. Go back to Egypt, in other words. Go back to the place where you have to be bound to the law. The law is not your school teacher showing you you need grace. The law is what gets you to heaven. That's what the Judaizers were saying. And yet we have examples of where that's completely wrong. For example, Galatians 5, 24 through 25 says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So Paul warns about the characteristics of those who resist the truth, and he says their end is destruction. These are the people that built on the, their house on the sand. These are the people that are walking, as Jesus said, on the Broadway that eventually leads to destruction. These are the, are the guests that crash, that crash the marriage supper of the Lamb, and they're cast into outer darkness when it is revealed that they don't belong there. These are the people who actually refuse to visit those that were in prison or to visit the sick or to clothe those who were naked or to bring food to the hungry and they were sent away why because they had a profession that did not lead to the example of what it means to live the christian life they had faith as james would say without works now those who are completely against the cross unfortunately we live in a culture where that's very prevalent. In fact, I, I, the only reason I use these examples is to, to bring you to the place where you understand where we've, we've arrived. Cardi B is a pop star that had a number one song that is so vulgar they could only use the initials of the song in the title, and yet it played on the radio enough 
and played through podcast and through uh, Spotify and through iTunes and all the places where you listen to music. It was listened to so much that it became the number one song in the country. And that wasn't a one-off. I mean, you would think, okay, well, maybe that could happen one time. But the number one song in the country right now is by a rapper. And the song is about, actually about Satan. And in the video, the rapper descends to hell and has a relationship with Satan and he decided to sell some tennis shoes associated with it. So he manufactured 666 pairs of tennis shoes that had a pentagram on the shoelaces. It had the number 666. It had a scripture reference from Luke, Luke chapter 10, that talks about seeing Satan falling from heaven like lightning. And to put the icing on the cake for all of this, each pair of shoes had a drop of human blood in with red dye that was actually inside the sole of the shoe. He sold them for $1,018 a pair. They sold out in less than a minute. And when he got to the Grammys this year, basically the Grammy Awards, which I used to watch because I, I used to, I, I like to listen to music and I wanted to see which songs made the top. The Grammy Awards actually fe- featured a pornographic segment between two female pop stars, Cardi B was one of them, Megan the Stallion was the other, and they actually did things on live TV, simulated things that were unthinkable. I mean, it was unbelievable. This is what happens when we decide for ourselves that we can recreate ourselves, that we can thumb our nose at God, and we can see it doesn't matter what the standards are that the Scripture set. We, that's when culture devolves into embracing these things and we become in a very precarious position. Paul says the end of all that, he's very specific, the end of it is destruction. Now the third thing I want us to see is the attitude of the, or, or rather the altitude of the right attitude. Verse 20 and 21, look at verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. How in the world, (laughs) people ask this question, how can we live in a world that produces and celebrates the kind of behavior that I was just talking about? This is how we do it. We remind ourselves that we are pilgrims passing through and that our citizenship is in heaven. And we encourage each other with those words. Philippi was a Roman colony that looked to Rome for directions on what it means to live as a Roman citizen. So the church should consider itself as sort of a heavenly colony. We look to heaven. We look to the Bible. We look to God. We look to Christ. We don't put our our trust in pop culture or Fox News or ESPN or anything else that would communicate to us the way that we're supposed to live, the way the culture says, but we depend on heaven because that's where our gaze is fixed. You know, there's a story about Lot and Abraham where their possessions became so great. God had blessed both of them so much they couldn't even stay together. They couldn't keep up with all their stuff. It was too much. And so they decided to go their separate ways. And it's very interesting what the Bible says about that. It says, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the well-watered plain of Sodom and Gomorrah. That is the, the area of Sodom. And by looks, it looked like by the standard that he set that that would be the place to live. But the Bible says God lifted up Abraham's eyes. And the gaze that Abraham had led him in a direction that kept him and his possessions safe. But Lot ended up almost totally destroyed because of the direction that he he chose. His gaze never made it past what the world had to offer, what the culture said was important. And we live in a world where that battle is raging. Right now we're being told as Christians that we're wrong and that we're bigoted if we don't agree that there's no difference between men and women, that that gender has no meaning. And we know that God's Word says we're created male and female. There's a, and there's a biological scientific fact that backs all of that up. We must not shy away as the church from being the church in the culture. We look to heaven. We get our direction, our call, our strength 
from heaven and from each other in the body of Christ as we hold each other accountable, as we encourage each other, and we stand for the truth, rejoicing that one day the reward will be heaven. You know, the balance between those things is so important. Jesus Christ guarantees our ultimate salvation because there's, there's, a lot of, there, there's a lot of energy on the power of thinking about the future when the future is heaven with God and with Christ. It's the promise that keeps us on track. Christ transforms and then seals our attitude. Look at verse 21. It says, who will transform, who? The Lord Jesus Christ, back in verse 20, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the execution of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Do you know that word subject, or is, it means to subdue? In the Greek, it means to arrange in ranks. That is, we should have the same priorities that is demonstrated in heaven by God and by Jesus Christ. Our, a lot of times, we get our priorities out of order. I mean, I'll just give you an example for music. I mean, if I was going to rank music according to the flesh, I'd have the Beatles and Clear, Credence Clearwater Revival at the top of my list. Okay, ask your parents, what is he talking about? I have no idea what he's talking about. Yeah, but, but I mean, that's just me. The Beatles and Creedence Clearwater Revival, John Fogarty. They'd be at the top of the list. But if I'm looking at the quality of music, if I'm looking to what the power of music can do, if I'm looking at it from a state of perfection, then I'm going to replace the Beatles and Credence with Beethoven and Chopin. Because those are the examples of what, it, it's a standard that we should aspire to. That should be the standard. And this is what Paul is trying to tell us. To live in the culture that's been created where the appetite is what controls everybody's desire. They live by what they want to be and what they think they can be, not by what God says they should be. If we're going to live in that world, then we've got to look to heaven and we've got to think about the now and the not yet. That's what theologians call it. And let me just, let me give you a quick example of what that means, the now and the not yet. The now is having the presence of Jesus Christ. It's having the power of the Holy Spirit. It's having the fellowship of believers. It's having all the things that is the blessing that flows into the church. That's the now. The not yet is the perfection and transformation of heaven. And you know, we're being made fit for heaven. That's what that's what sanctification is all about. That's why we should constantly be getting closer and closer to the example that Jesus set because we're getting ready for heaven. That's the point, to get us to that point of where we reach glorification. You know, we're going to get new bodies. Everything is going to be new. So we should order ourselves, subdue, put in rank in the right order the things that we're doing today that will make us more fit for heaven. I think about Acts chapter 1, verse 10, when I think about the now and the not yet. You know, it says when Jesus ascended to heaven, the disciples were standing there on the hill, and they watched him rise up to heaven. I can't imagine what that would be like. I mean, you're looking into heaven, and you're seeing the Savior who just came out back from the grave, and he's rising up to heaven. And as they were standing there, gazing into heaven, you kind of get the idea that he had already disappeared, and they're still looking. Because they're kind of awestruck. And yet two angelic beings show up and say, what are you doing standing here, gazing into heaven? The one you just saw go up to heaven, he's coming back. What's the message of that statement? You live in the now. That's the not yet. The not yet is Christ coming from heaven. We know that's the promise, but because he's coming and because we know he's ascended, we live in the now according to the way God calls us, the, according to the way God's Word instructs us to live. That's what Paul's telling the Philippians. That's what he's telling us today. Let's stand together for invitation. Father, I pray in these moments that we would understand the now and the not yet, that we would understand 
that our appetites, the things that we are hungry for, will, de- will reveal what's going on with our attitude. That if our attitude is to seek you, O oh God, then our appetites are going to be for the things above, not the things that are driven by the culture. Help us, O oh Lord, to have the right attitude transformed by your presence in our life, made clean and being fit for heaven. We look forward to that day, Lord, and until then, help us to be good witnesses and good examples that others can follow of what it means to follow Jesus.